ओके सो गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन आफ्टर द गुफ्ट गुड आफ्टरनून सो वी आर कमिंग टू द फैग एंड ऑफ टूडेज कॉन्फ्रेंस वी हैव हैड वेरी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग इंसाइटफुल सेशंस एंड नाउ वी मूव ऑन टू वन ऑफ द मोस्ट शॉर्ट आफ्टर सेशंस ऑफ द डे is what the feedback we we got from most of the participants so for our next session financial repression and the great reset and it's my great great pleasure to invite ms ritika mankar a fellow cfa charter holder a fellow director on the board till some time back very very accomplished economist and i think the best person to moderate this session Uh, she is a strategist at Global Investment Strategy BCA Research in her current role. With that, I would like to invite Ritika. Over to you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I know uh, I and Russell Napier are the only two people keeping you away from Saturday night. Uh, so I'm deeply, deeply aware of the responsibility I'm shouldering, uh, and so is Russell. uh before i get into you know uh uh you know try to do justice uh, to russell napier's and what he is uh we're going to do a quick poll and i'm going to request uh everybody here to make sure that the camera points towards the audience uh so that russell can see the response to two questions that i'm going to raise uh this is this is my ploy to shake you guys up uh to make sure that you guys don't miss out a single point of what russell napier's is going to tell you Question number one, uh, and I want people who agree to raise their hands when I raise this question. Question number one. Uh, so, if you look at the post-GFC period uh, from 2008 to date, uh, despite the horrendous year that the U.S. market saw in 2022, uh, the U.S. has actually outperformed the global markets by a very respectable margin. How many of you here think? Uh, that over the next five years, the U.S. will continue to outperform global markets. Can we have a show of hands uh, for people who think that the U.S. will continue to outperform? Okay, I'm going to put that number to a uh, 45 percent. Uh, Russell, uh, no pressure. Uh, just, just wanted to let you know, 45 percent of people here think that the U.S. will continue to outperform. Uh, question number two. uh so china china has been a big problem for any global investor and also for indian investors to the extent that it affects energy prices materials prices how many of you here think uh that china will surprise on the upside over the next 5 years uh can we have a show of hands please wow uh that's that's also a very very healthy number i'm going to put it at a 65% russell 65% of the audience thinks uh that china has disappointed so far but don't extrapolate that into the future uh with those with those two questions done i'm going to try and do justice uh to russell napier's introduction uh i've been given you know a big write up here uh but let me tell you that anybody anybody who's worked in the indian sell side knows that russell napier's is like a demigod uh he's worked at clsa for close to two decades during that period all of us have probably read some of the work that he's written uh some of us have really really valued the calls he's made uh things that you know veterans from the sell side like myself as well as you know people in the asset management industry remember to this day uh so that's that's really what russell napier is but now i'll quickly dive into the official piece that i've been handed over by the cfa society uh russell napier is the author of the solid ground investment report for invest institutional investors and co-founder of the investment research portal eric a business he now co-owns with dc thompson uh, russell is also the author of the book anatomy of the bear a cult classic according to the financial times uh, he is also the founder director of the practical history of financial markets at the edinburgh business school uh, he is also a member of the investment advisory committee of three asset management companies uh, so in that sense he's seen both sides of the coin the sell side and the buy side uh, so without further ado i'll hand over uh, to my uh, mind the best speaker of today uh, over to you russell uh, we are all keen to hear what you think happens uh, globally over the next few years
also formed and run, and there is one in India, in Pune, uh, at the Flame University, which is a business and financial history library. Russell, if you I could just it. stop you here for a second, if you could just start from the beginning now, because the audience started hearing you just five seconds ago. Okay, thank you very much, Ridika, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I would just add to it the Library of Mistakes, uh, which is a business and financial history library. And of course, I would add that because there is one in India, in Pune, at the Flame University. Uh, thank you again. The financial repression... Recording in progress. ...is something you may have heard a lot about in recent years. I'm going to update you as to where we've got to in terms of financial repression. Uh, think of it as the license rash. The license rash was financial repression. And I know there'll be some of you in the audience old enough to remember it. The good news is it's not coming to India. The bad news is it's coming to the developed world. Uh, that, I think, hopefully frames what's coming next and hopefully frames the opportunity in some markets and the risks and threats in others. Uh, it even comes to the United States of America, which is one of the reasons why I disagree with those who think the U.S. will outperform. So here is where we are in the world on a macro perspective. I'll then give you the, uh, the conclusions from a micro perspective of where you should be investing. Uh, world financial debt to GDP is at a record high. This is the government plus the non-financial corporate sector plus the household sector. It's never been higher in human history. Now that's an extreme point, and I think it should get us thinking about extreme outcomes. Uh, and what I see in the marketplace today is people not thinking about extreme outcomes. What I see people thinking about are business cycles, where we are in this cycle, when does the Fed pivot, where does growth go, where does inflation go? These are clearly important questions, and I will do my best to answer them. But there's something bigger going on here, which is a structural change. Uh, a change domestically in most developed world economies, and a change in the global monetary system, and a change in who runs monetary policy. Now, those will be the biggest changes that I've seen in my career. Uh, my career began in 1989. I'm going to talk about those today uh, and put them in a context uh, which, which hopefully is useful if you're investing in India or elsewhere uh, in the world. Something peculiar has happened in the last two years. Just uh, 18 months ago, we saw broad money growth at a 30-year high. Suddenly, after years of failure, we worked out how to produce money. Or somebody worked it out. Was it the central bankers? Uh, my conclusion is it was the governments who worked out how to create money. And what they've worked out is something that they should have long known, that if they get involved in the banking system, directly or indirectly, by offering sticks and carrots, and if governments can control the growth in bank credit, then they can control the growth in money. Interest rates in that scenario become less relevant, as they were in the entire period from uh, 1939 to 1979, a 40-year period, where monetary policy in the developed world really wasn't run by using interest rates. It was run by the governments interven intervening to steer the growth in bank credit and money supply growth. That revolution is underway, uh, but is ignored. And the fixation on central bankers, I think, is dangerous because we're missing the real story. That's what a financial repression is, and I'll talk about how that works. Ultimately, we get to yield curve control. You hear a lot of talk about the everything bubble, all assets are overvalued and all of them must fall. Well, there is one bubble that rules them all, and that bubble is in government debt, because I can tell you that in the summer of 2020, the price of government debt had reached a 5,000-year high. A 5,000-year low for interest rates for the public sector, but also for the private sector, occurred as debt to GDP reached an all-time high, and that is our one problem. Now, there are only two ways you can look at the future. Either the governments of the developed world allow the bond market bubble to burst, allow nominal rates to reset to a level that is commensurate with inflation, which is what's in the textbooks, that interest rates will inflect, reflect inflation expectations. They either allow that to happen or they don't. Uh, I think everybody today is working on the basis that the bond market is largely a free market, a market where the price will be determined by the market. I disagree with that. So I'm in the other camp, the camp that says the bubble to rule them all will not be allowed to burst. And therefore, we need to look at asset prices in a very different way uh, than we have for the past 30 years. Uh, and the way you stop it from bursting is financial repression, or let's call it the license rise. 
Therefore, we live in a world of higher than expected inflation, uh, lower than expected interest rates, because the two are disconnected as we move away from the market system. And the consequence of that is that equity prices come down more slowly. They don't collapse. Now, this is really important because really the last three downswings in the business cycle in the US have been associated with a collapse in the price of equities, whether that was 2020, 2008, 2009, or 2001 to 2003. And we've come to believe that that is normal, that recessions in the US come with the risk of deflation, they come with the risk of bankruptcy, and therefore equity prices can fall incredibly rapidly and valuations can come down rapidly. Uh, but what I'll show you is that is not the history of the US stock market. There are other types of bear markets, and there are prolonged bear markets in which corporate earnings grow strongly and equity prices come down anyway. That is what I think the outcome for the US is, and it's one of the reasons why I think it will not outperform over the next several years. But the prime reason is it's starting valuation. So here are the consequences from financial repression before we get into the, the arguments. Uh, U.S. stocks are overowned. The index is actually dangerous. The price to book ratio of the S&P 500 is 4.1. Price to book ratio of the Nasdaq is 4.6. It is possible to go around the world and buy equities trading significantly below two times book. Many of them with return on equity not dissimilar to the S&P 500. Most of those would be in the emerging markets. You would be aware that India has a much higher price to book ratio. But there are many markets in the emerging markets that are trading on 60% discounts in terms of price to book with similar return on equities. We'll come back to discuss the nature of those return on equities uh, between the US way of achieving them, the emerging market way of achieving them. Uh, but the bottom line is, as an investor, you're interested in that return on equity, you're interested in the cash flow, uh, and those figures make much more sense in the emerging markets. So that's the case for the emerging markets. Uh, there will be a developed world capital expenditure boom. We've lacked that for many, many, many years, for actually a few decades since we've seen that CapEx boom in tangible physical capital. Uh, the past, as you know, has been a situation where many corporates, particularly Americans, have outsourced the creation of tangible capital to China and become um, asset light, brand heavy. And that's been a very profitable business model. And one of the reasons I think that American equities begin to underperform is that that business model has finished. And the future lies for those who create physical capital in the developed world to achieve and answer some of the political problems that we have, one of which is climate change, uh, the other which is doing less business with China. So suddenly, for the first time, almost in my career, we see a developed world capex boom. And many of the companies that are involved in that are very lowly priced, very lowly valued, under-researched, undercovered, uh, and I think represent good value, even if the S&P itself is extremely overvalued at 4.1 times book. Uh, less competition from China gives us a different positive, which is a, a renaissance for many of the companies that have struggled to compete with China uh, over the last few decades. Uh, that is a geopolitical shift in terms of our uh, competitive situation with China. We will all have our own opinions as to how bad this Cold War gets. But the worse that Cold War gets, uh, the more you will see a higher ROE for those companies uh, that are involved in competing with China. The competitive yoke from China is being lifted. Lifted, I think, anyway, through the uh, higher uh, costs in China over many, many years, but actually lifted for geopolitical reasons. Uh, and finally, that, that final point, an important one, it's a long equity bear market, not a short one. Why is that so important for you? Well, I think we saw from 2007 to 2009 what happens when the U.S. equity market comes down quickly. There is really very little in the world that goes up in terms of equities because a pronounced decline is usually associated with the deflation and financial market instability, perhaps insolvency, that we've come to associate with U.S. recessions. Uh, and even the Indian market isn't going to go up if that's happening in America, nor is the Japanese market, uh, nor is the Indonesian market, nor is the United Kingdom market, if we go back into one of those episodes. To suggest that you buy cheap equities and own and hold them, you have to believe that the everything bubble isn't going to burst in a deflationary bust. Uh, and that is what financial repression is all about. It's about stopping that. That may sound positive, but there are many negative consequences from moving to this financial repression. 
uh, a chart you'll be very familiar with, which is the cyclically adjusted PE, the Schiller PE for the US market, uh, going back to 1881. And I'm sure you all know this, but it is the 10 year rolling average of earnings of the S&P rather than the current PE using current year's earnings or the forecast PE using next year's earnings. The idea is it smooths out the, earn, the earnings power of uh, US corporates and gives you a better, lie of their, better idea of their underlying profitability uh, and irons out some of the impact that comes to profitability from the uh, business cycle. You'll see that US equities are very expensive. It, it isn't difficult to look at the chart and conclude that there's a bubble that has to burst. Uh, clearly, equities have been more expensive before, but not for long periods of U.S. history. The bust, the 29 to 32 bust, the 2000 to 2003 bust, the 2007 to 2009 bust, all associated with the same thing, which is deflation. And deflation brings a fall in cash flow that threatens the very survivability of equity. But have a look. There are two very long-term bear markets in this chart. 1901 to 1921, and 1966 to 1982. They both took a long time. And what conditions determined this long, slow decline in equity valuation? Well, it was a surprising inflation, not the surprise of deflation, but the surprise of inflation. And therefore, over that very long period, a surprise in the discount rate. The discount rate went to levels that people had not contemplated in 1901 or 1966. And therefore, you lost money not because corporate earnings came down. Corporate earnings were strong through both periods. You lost money because the valuations came down. Now, we can go back to 1966 and say, well, what had happened if you bought equities at low valuations, reasonable valuations? The answer is they would have protected you from the ravages of inflation. The lesson from the 1970s is not that equities do not protect you from inflation. It's that overvalued equities do not protect you from inflation. So looking at the S&P 500, it isn't difficult to say that if the future is higher inflation, so it's not higher than the current level, but it's higher in sustainable inflation than we've been used to for the last 30 years, then the long-term decline in, in the, 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 the valuation is the risk for the S&P. That is independent of earnings. Earnings could do well, and earnings did do well in nominal terms from 66 to 82. I show this to show that there is another way for overvalued equity markets to become cheap. It doesn't have to be the great bust. It can be a longer, slower decline with its own challenges, but it does open up opportunities for profit if you can find cheap equities. Going back to 1966, there were equities that outperformed over that long period. They were called value equities. And the fundamental reason they outperformed is they didn't have the valuation risk by definition of value equity being defined by its low valuation. So this is an outcome for equities, which I think is uh, clearly not positive in the, in the, uh, for some markets, and not, not positive for this S&P 500, but creates opportunities and creates the opportunity to profit and defeat inflation by investing in equities. Uh, here is the unique situation we find ourselves in, and I'm not picking, in the U picking on the U.S. particularly, but the U.S. as ever has the good, really good long-term data, so I, fl I flag it up from World War II. Uh, you'll often hear it said that U.S. debt to GDP is approaching World War II levels. Well, it's significantly above World War II levels, as you can see, because we have a fixation when we talk about debt to GDP about talking about government debt to GDP. But the debt to GDP that counts is this total non-financial debt to GDP, which is the government plus the household sector uh, plus non-financial corporations. Uh, we just have never seen anything like this before in human history. And if we were to get Europe, it would start at a much higher level after the war because Europe was much, heavily, much more heavily involved in that war. But even in Europe, if we could get a number that incorporated the private sector, we would find it was at or above World War II levels. This is why you should expect something dramatic to happen, a structural change to happen. Uh, and the lesson for our policymakers in the developed world of the last few years, uh, or last 15 years, is that recessions can bring the risk of default and collapse because debt levels are so high. That's the lesson from 09. It's the lesson even from 2020. And the government had to take extreme measures in 2020 to prevent it. And I stress the government not the central banker, 
The central banker did things. But really, since the bankruptcy of Lehman's, the governments have been getting more active and active to reduce private sector credit risk by providing more intervention. And you will often hear it said that the central bank, put has gone. Well, we can debate that back and forward for a long time. But the point is that government put is stronger than ever. And we witnessed that in 2020. And it's because of this. It's because the stat level is so high. That intervention is so high. So what financial repression is about is trying to get this lower without getting us into a period of bankruptcy. And here is the uh, five ways that you can solve this problem. I'm not going to dwell on these. I think you can understand them. Uh, but they are only five ways to do this. Remember, you're the policymaker. You're making this choice. Austerity. Uh, well, I'm phoning you from Scotland. There is no sign of austerity anywhere near here. Government spending is going up pretty rapidly. Uh, there's no sign that any government would run a fiscal surplus, seems bizarre even to talk about it, and start repaying its debt, or run a much smaller fiscal deficit and hope that growth bails them out. Uh, politically, that's not where we are in the developed world. Default, well, the, the Bank of England estimate you get a 7% decline in GDP if you default on your government debt. Greece has defaulted on its government debt. That didn't really help very much. Um, obviously, Lehman Brothers was a great default, $600 billion default on the private sector. That didn't help growth very much. So default is a way forward, but it's not one that has been successful uh, in terms of returning a country to high levels of growth. Uh, real growth is the real positive way we solve this problem. Uh, it, needs it needs a productivity revolution. Once again, that's a probably a 90-minute conversation as to how we could get that productivity re uh, revolution and basically and have very high real growth and still have low inflation. Uh, but it's not within the gift of the government. Uh, and we hope that the private sector brings forth uh, something in terms of a technological revolution that gives us a productivity revolution. But that's a hope. Uh, it's unlikely to be a choice by a policymaker because I don't think they can actually do that. I don't think they'll sit back and wait for a productivity revolution to solve this problem. Hyperinflation, well, you can see how France managed its excessively high level of debt GDP after World War II. But that is a social lottery. Uh, and every politician is aware of that. Uh, and that leaves repression. And repression is stealing money from old people slowly. That's what repression is. And frankly, you don't really need to do the others if you can do the last one. And the last one clearly has social ramifications, uh, but those social ramifications are much smaller than hyperinflation, default and austerity. And that is the world we're moving into. Repression at its core is a need to keep interest rates and the yield curve below the rate of inflation. You think you know how that's done because the central bankers have been doing that now for quite some time. But ultimately, it cannot be done by central bankers. And this is where Japan and what's happening in Japan is really very, very important. We have seen and are seeing day by day the consequences of a central bank attempting yield curve control in a period of high and rising inflation. And it isn't working. It's forcing the central bank to buy more and more bonds. It's forcing a rapid expansion in their balance sheet. It's forcing a creation of high powered money. And if you think of the antithesis of monetary policy in a period of rising inflation, it would be holding down interest rates and having great growth in the central bank balance sheet. And Japan is choosing both of those. Uh, and that is not sustainable. Uh, many people, most people are forecasting that they have to back away from that, that they have to let interest rates go up that the bond yield will have to go to a higher level. And that is the only way out of this. But of course, it isn't the only way out of this. The other way out of this is financial repression. And that is forcing your savings institutions to buy government bonds at a yield you dictate. Now, things are coming to a head in Japan. So if this forecast and this discussion on financial repression is to be correct, then maybe we're going to get some evidence of that coming out of Japan really quite quickly uh, as the third option. Don't keep yields low and keep expanding your balance sheet. Don't let yields go up. Force the savings institutions to buy government bonds. Uh, now, I don't have time to discuss the near-term uh, implications of that, but one uh, thing to leave you with, the Japanese institutions own $2.2 trillion worth of foreign currency bonds and $1.8 trillion worth of foreign equities. The most likely asset they would sell if forced to buy JGBs would be foreign government bonds simply because they're the most liquid. So, so that's the framework. Uh, if you think I'm wrong, you've got to pick one of these other options for the developed world and say which one of those it's likely to be. Uh, but repression is the least painful of a painful bunch of options for the government uh, unless we get that productivity revolution 
which would be most likely a technological breakthrough in the price of energy. So as I said, America is not alone. Uh, you can see where we are in terms of the rest of the world. America actually is down there uh, pretty close to the average. Uh, Japan will not surprise you to know as much higher, but look at France. You know, this is a developed world problem. I have India at the bottom, and you can see that this number is exceptionally low for India. In fact, emerging markets, if we take out China, uh, falls down close to Indian levels. There is a lesson from the Asian financial crisis, I think it may have been 25 years ago, but it has had a huge impact on most of Asia in particular uh, to run with low debt levels. Look at the difference between the debt to GDP level of China and India. Remarkably, if we go back to sort of 2007, just before the great financial crisis, you would have found India and China with roughly similar debt to GDP levels. But China's growth over the period since 2007 has been really financed by debt. All right, there's lots of debt in India as well, but the pace of growth in debt in India has been marginal compared to the growth in China. This is the first time, probably post-World War II, that China has had a higher debt to GDP ratio than the United States of America. It had half the level of the US roughly in 2007. So the Chinese balance sheet has been transformed for the worse uh, over those last years since the GFC. And it too has to go for financial repression. Now, I know you'll say, well, it's always had financial repression, and it's had a legacy of financial repression from the communist era. Uh, but it's tried to move away from that, but it's had to keep lots of it. Now, it will have to go back in the other direction. And it, too, will have to inflate away its debts. Uh, and I think one of the bigger conclusions from a financial repression and from this data is that if China needs to create enough money to inflate away its debts, it cannot do so with a managed exchange rate regime. Uh, remember, you can only manage one monetary variable at a time. That's the first rule of monetary economics. China has got a bit of flexibility on that uh, because it has capital controls. Uh, but ultimately, if you want to create more money, you can't run with a stable exchange rate. Uh, so in my opinion, and I can't say when, China will have to move to a more flexible exchange rate because it will have to move to a financial repression and reduce uh, these debt to GDP numbers. Uh, there is a, about an hour's worth of material just in this data alone, but look at the gap between France and Germany. I ask all of you, if you were the central banker of Europe, of the Eurozone, how could you set an interest rate that is appropriate for both France and Germany? And this is a problem that's been getting bigger and bigger for many years. When the Euro was launched, uh, these countries had, in terms of their private sector debt service ratios, very similar numbers, and now they're completely different, as we'll see in a minute. So my conclusions from this data is the entire developed world has to do financial repression. India doesn't. Emerging markets don't. What is the consequence for India? You should see more capital coming to India. The first rule of financial repression, if you're a saver, is get your money out of the country. The odds are being stacked against you. The capital allocation rule, the government is playing a much bigger role in that. They might be forcing your pension fund or life fund to buy government bonds. They might be providing credit guarantees to certain uh, types of corporation, which mean banks lend there. In other words, the government's playing a role in capital allocation. This is what I mean about the license raj. This is what's coming to the developed world. And I think the secret of the license raj was not to have your money in India if you could have it somewhere else. And I talk here particularly as a portfolio investor, uh, maybe not so much as a direct investor. Direct investors learn the rules and play the rules quite quickly, but portfolio investors really shouldn't be getting involved in this type of situation. I'm asked all the time, if we want to remove our capital from any of these countries likely to do financial repression, where should we put it? And the options are limited. Even Switzerland has a high debt to GDP ratio. Uh, I think many of you will know that Singapore is doing exceptionally well uh, from this situation with flight capital coming not just from China, but coming from Europe and America. Uh, but it's my opinion that quite a lot of this portfolio capital will come to emerging markets, because what we don't expect in emerging markets and shouldn't expect given this data is a massive structural shift in how the economy works. However, the Indian economy works today, it isn't likely to see the structural shift that's coming for the United Kingdom, United States, Germany and France. Uh, and therefore, uh, as investors in India, you know the rules, and those rules may change a little bit. They're always changing. That's the challenge for all of us. But they're not going to go through a wholesale change the way they will in the developed world. This will attract 
portfolio capital to India and the emerging markets in general. Uh, the other thing that's going on here is the friends shoring, which is another long discussion about friends shoring capital coming away from China, looking for other places to produce is also positive uh, for emerging markets and also for India. We are looking uh, for most emerging markets, not the Indian market, as you know, but for most emerging markets, we're looking at exceptionally low valuations for stock markets at a time when both portfolio capital and friends showing capital uh, is likely to be arriving. This is very positive, particularly at a time when current accounts are in much better condition than they normally are. I say normally, I'm looking back, obviously, to that great crisis uh, of the 1990s. Uh, so I think this data is incredibly bullish and positive uh, for emerging markets. Uh, we'll just move on quickly. I think I've covered all of those points. So the problem with debt to GDP, it's a stock to a flow. Uh, debt is a stock, GDP is a flow. Let's try and look at a flow to a flow. Uh, I often, when I show debt to GDP, people say, or they used to say, don't worry about that, interest rates are so low, doesn't really matter. Well, as you know, they're not so low anymore. Uh, but this is crucial in trying to estimate where interest rates can go higher and where they can't. So there are three elements in this. The, uh, the, the uh, big number is private sector income. And what we're looking at is the total cost of servicing debt as a percentage of private sector income. So that includes interest expense, but it also includes something for the uh, amortization of principal. What is the history of these numbers? Well, we put them together after the great, uh, the great Asian crisis to uh, have a better insight as to vulnerabilities. And the, uh, the conclusion, the rule of thumb, since the data was published in 1999 is, if this number is around 20% or higher and interest rates rise, then there is a high probability of a private sector debt crisis. Now, you can only say a high probability, it depends a lot on the tenor of the borrowing, the maturity of the borrowing. Uh, if everybody in the economy is borrowed overnight, then rapidly rising interest rates can get you into trouble very quickly. Uh, if they're all borrowed at 30 years, then obviously it'll take significantly longer to do that. And here's the problem. We had interest rates at a 5,000 year low, and we had many private sector debt service ratios, probably at all time highs. We've probably never seen levels like this in human history. We certainly haven't seen many of them since 1998. So you can look through the recorded peaks since 1998 there and see which countries are close to those recorded peaks. Uh, but you'll see a lot of countries at or above 20%. And that's really how they've been, uh, been ranked here on the whole. The problem, once again, is that France is on the list. China is on the list. In other words, big economies are on the list. And they really can't cope with rising interest rates. So I know the ECB talks a lot about rising rates and pushing rates up. Uh, but very soon that will create some very negative consequences in Europe. What has this got to do with financial repression? Well, what it's got to do is with the timing. We are trying to work out who goes first. Now, my view on this for some time is that Japan would go first, Europe would go second, perhaps the United Kingdom next, and then America. In terms of the bigger economies of the world, that would be the sequencing. And this sequencing is really, really important. Look at 2022. The Bank of Japan decided to continue to suppress its yield curve when others stopped. What was the consequence? Well, a collapse in the end. That was the consequence. The consequence of moving to financial repression first is that money leaves the country. Uh, and that is particularly true in Japan so far in, in 2022. As I've said, there is no room for savers in a financial repression. You should be looking elsewhere. Uh, now, if we start with Japan at the bottom of the uh, first column, you'll see that it's only at 15.6%, and a bit below its recorded peak, which would have been in 1998. But interest expense is going up incredibly rapidly. This is the problem with the world we live in. If interest rates go from 25 basis points to 50 basis points, for the government at least, interest expense just went up 100%. Now, I think if you're looking at 15.6%, you can see just how quickly that can start leaping higher. Now, the private sector of Japan was not really borrowing at 25 basis points. Uh, its interest expense may not have doubled, but it's still going up at a rapid rate. Uh, and this number can get out of control very quickly. If so, then what about France? Uh, what about Sweden? What about Canada? The developed world simply can't cope with these higher rates of interest, and therefore we won't get them. We won't get them. Central bankers will not inflict them. And the bond market investor, even if he's really 
concerned about inflation will not be allowed to inflict them upon the economy. They will have to be stopped. And that's what financial repression is. And, and there's the problem. You force savings institutions to buy government bonds and you force them to sell something. And we have to work out what they sell. And equities will be on that list. So when I talk about an overvalued US stock market, you might think, well, if the valuation's coming down, that's going to have to be via higher interest rates. But it doesn't have to be that way in a financial repression. The force that could bring down valuations over the long term, and relatively slowly rather than a great crash, because earnings would be doing well, is the compelled liquidation of equity portfolios by savings institutions forced to buy government bonds. The price of money is the truth, and the secret, and the truth is, the developed world can't handle the truth, and therefore they will suspend the truth. Now, that's why I think it has some similarities to the license rise, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the distortions that brings, but you're all experienced investors, and I think you know the distortions that brings. Uh, back to our table, and let's look at the second side of it. Once again, if we're looking for countries that don't have this problem, we are in the emerging markets, Indonesia, Mexico, maybe Poland, India, obviously, uh, Hungary, Czech Republic, South Africa, you know, these are incredibly low numbers. It's the legacy of the Asian financial crisis that Asia in particular has decided to progress without very much debt. So just to bring this up to date a little bit, who's making any progress in getting rid of the debt? Okay, so we're coming out of COVID. You suddenly have high inflation. So you, on the upside, and I know most of us as investors see that as a downside, but on the upside, you've got very high growth in private sector income. Nominal terms, it's doing quite nicely. So your debt service ratio should be going down. But then we go to the second quarter of 2022 and things get more difficult because it's then that interest rates really start to rise. So now these two variables are in a race against each other. Yes, we have growth in private sector income, probably around 12% given the level of inflation. But we have interest expense going up 30, 40, 50, 60, 70% because interest rates are going from very low levels. So who's succeeding in getting this number to come down and who's failing? Well, as you can see at the minute, Brazil is failing, and that's because its nominal interest rates are really very high. Let's see if they start to come down. Actually, even Switzerland is failing. Uh, there's an initial flush of, of, in this column, what you see is we had rising private sector income, but no rise in uh, interest rates. They started to come down. But who is seeing post-pandemic rises? Uh, China, not a great surprise because China does not have high nominal GDP growth at the minute because it doesn't have high inflation. France, I keep coming back to France because it's really, really important. Uh, Hong Kong, Hungary, I've put the ones here that actually, if you're not on this list, then you're actually succeeding. So for instance, the US private sector debt service ratio coming down even in second quarter of 22, even as rates were going up, the United Kingdom similarly on the right level. Uh, India also at the right place. Uh, but these are the countries that are in the wrong place, and some of them are particularly important. Uh, the US up just a tiny little bit. So the evidence is coming out of COVID that the current level of nominal GDP growth for the developed world and the gap between that and interest rates for these countries, it's not enough. And that's pretty alarming that it's not enough because the gap is big. And the problem is interest expense is rising. So either they don't uh, either they accept this or they don't accept it. My opinion is they don't accept it uh, and we get to yield curve control. Uh, just quickly on the business cycle in repression, uh, it's not as violent and as negative as it is in a free market system uh, because there are lots of safety nets in place. Uh, and we found that in 2020. Yeah, I think it's really stunning that the market today is talking about a form of recession that might look a little bit like 2007 to 2009. And yet the 2020 recession was one in which corporate profits didn't do too badly. The stock market within three or four months was back to an all-time high. That's because there was a safety net put under by the government. And the, the inference by the markets today is that that safety net is no longer available. And I really don't see where that conclusion comes from. As I said at the beginning, there may not be, to the same extent, a central bank put. But my goodness, there's a government put. Good example, the United Kingdom just called in all its bankers and told it basically not to foreclose on people who cannot make interest payments on their mortgages. In fact, as a, US, as a UK citizen, I can go to my bank and say, I reasonably expect 
not to be able to make my mortgage payments. Uh, and we can come to a, a, a consideration and agreement on that. What sort of business cycle will it be if those things are suspended? And how much power lies with the central banker if the government is acting to mitigate some of the impact of higher interest rates through that? Uh, across Europe in particular, we see government guarantees on bank credit. Yes, interest rates may be going up. Yes, the central bank may think that's going to have an impact. But if a government keeps mitigating it, uh, then the government put is more powerful than the central bank put. Power is shifting. Power is shifting from a monetary authority that is the central bank to the government. It's shifting through these guarantees. It's shifting through the government interfering with the banking system. And it will, the ultimate shift will be when governments get to yield curve control. Because remember, it's governments that will determine that yield curve control. If a government controls the price of money, i.e. it dictates the yield curve, but also it dictates the quantity of money through controlling the growth in bank credit, then the government is the monetary authority. And that's the transition which is underway. Uh, and it's why I think the fixation on central bankers uh, is overdone. So in this type of business cycle, you don't get deflation, you don't get default, you don't get bankruptcy, uh, but you get instead this government intervention. And over the long term, you weaken the ability of the private sector to allocate capital, you weaken return on equity. Uh, and the bear market is based upon that. The bear, the bear market is based upon the inefficiency of the allocation of capital in the new license raj. That is the bear market, not through higher interest rates, not through vicious recessions associated with uh, depression. So we have to ask our question, why is it that bank credit continues to grow in what is now probably a recession in Europe? Why did it continue to grow in 2020? Uh, Mark Twain's definition of a banker is a man who will lend you an umbrella until it starts raining. The evidence here is that that's exactly what banking used to be. As you can see in 2008, bankers stopped lending. In the great uh, sovereign debt crisis of 2012, bankers actually contracted their loan books. But in the 2020 recession, they expanded their loan books and they're expanding them today. And in the conference, recent conference call for Commerzbank, the CFO was asked, why are you expanding your balance sheet in a recession? And she replied, because our credit risk is guaranteed. Now, that might be explicit for certain companies. Obviously, energy companies are explicitly guaranteed now in Europe. There, there is no private sector credit risk there. Uh, but she meant implicitly. That's what they learned in 2020. The bankers piled up huge provisions in 2020 to cope with the recession, didn't need them, because the government intervened to ensure that the private sector didn't go bankruptcy, the bankrupt. In a world where bank credit expands through a recession, can it be the type of recession we've been used to in the 21st century, uh, where credit becomes less available, there's financial instability, we worry about the very survivability of equity, uh, prices decline. That's what we've become used to, that's our availability bias, but there is a different form of recession. And I think the trends in bank credit growth tell us we're there. You see a similar pattern in US bank credit growth. Uh, this has just started to roll over in the last few weeks, so we need to keep a, a careful eye on it. But once again, through 2020 and through 2022, bank credit growth expands. This is not what's supposed to happen. We have to really, really ask why. Uh, and my opinion is because of the intervention of the state, it changes the nature of the business cycle and it changes who runs monetary authority. Uh, I'll let you have a look at the data, but I'm really putting this up to show every recession since World War II and the impact on S&P 500 EPS. The last three recessions, it's been pretty bad. The last four recessions, it's been pretty bad. But then recessions before that, and those were the inflations where there was, or sorry, the recessions where there was inflation, uh, the average is actually 11, minus 11, with a very big range. What if we're back in that type of business cycle? Because we're in this business cycle with inflation and the state underwriting private sector credit risk. Uh, the stock market has fallen uh, at its lows down over 30% in terms of its valuation, its CAPE ratio. Uh, if a US stock market falls 30%, and then we find out that in this new type of recession, earnings are only gonna fall 11%, uh, has most of the damage been done to equity markets? I think it is. Uh, that's positive in the U.S. stock market, uh, but in the long run, I think we've got bigger problems for the U.S. stock market. Uh, but recessions, as you can see, used to be very different. 
Uh, and you used to get the NIPA profits pretty close to S&P 500 EPS. So NIPA profits are the profits that corporates report to the government for taxation purposes. Maybe a better guide to actual underlying corporate profitability. But look what happens here. A massive distortion, a massive difference between these two numbers. Uh, and that's really, there are lots of reasons for that, but it's partially because economy, or sorry, accountants started writing off a lot of assets and pushing them through the P&L. That wasn't a difficult thing to do in those types of recession associated with deflation, uh, bad debts and financial instability. Uh, but it's a very difficult thing to do if you live in a recession that comes with inflation. So we might find the trend in earnings being more like this than this going forward. So we need to reorientate and recalibrate ourselves for this time of recession. Uh, you can see the, the CAPE, uh, which I've already discussed. I don't think I'll go through this uh, again, but just imagine what it means for the world if the decline in this is really slower and longer than the great deflationary bust that we recently had. So here's what you expect. This is the menu. I will speed up now. You should expect interest rates no longer to be linked to supply and demand, but to be politically mandated. Capital controls so far have been an essential tool of financial repression. You will know that from the history of uh, India before 1991 in particular. Compelled liquidation of equities forces down equity valuations. Uh, there is a real question as to whether the euro can survive. Financial repression in the United Kingdom takes power from the central bank to the government. But in the European context, it takes power from the European central bank to 20 different governments. Now, that is not a centralization of monetary authority. Uh, and is very dangerous uh, for the uh, survivability of the of the euro. Uh, that's not a quick thing, it's a slow thing. Uh, and slating away debts is very bad for fixed interest securities. You shouldn't own any, of, uh, own any of those. Some corporations benefit more than others from higher inflation, mainly because they have an element of fixed cost, whether that's depreciation or interest expense. Uh, the end of increased competition from China, which is a Cold War geopolitical call. It's not really an economic call. It's one you'll have to make for yourselves. But if it comes, then there are many, many industries in Japan in particular that are reinvigorated, that have really struggled to compete with China and that uh, you should be looking uh, into Japan. Uh, can emerging markets ex-China avoid repression? Yes. The debt levels are at such a level that whatever the structure of the Indian economy is, it can run with that for many years to come. It may even get better uh, there may even be less government interference. There might be a bit more, but it doesn't have this sea change. Uh, in terms of the lessons from our last financial repression, 45 to 78, never buy bonds, buy gold, and buy selected equities. Uh, and just in case you haven't got the conclusion, the conclusion is Japanese equities represent good value. Uh, value equities don't have a valuation risk. You should look at those. There's going to be a capital expenditure boom. You should look at those types of corporations. Uh, you should buy emerging markets and uh, you should also look uh, for companies that are no longer competing with China. Add all that up, and what does it come to as a percentage of global market capitalization? Well, I'd be surprised if it was more than 15%, because the U.S. market has come to dominate, uh, and the low asset, tangible asset, high brand assets, those kind of dominate the S&P, uh, and their time has been, uh, and their time has gone. So finally, and this is finally, this is the issue of a repression. You begin to get the government allocating capital and credit, saying who should get it and who doesn't get it. So keeping private sector current on its debt, which we've already seen in the 2020 recession, will be good for banks. And using the banks, as is already happening, to get credit flowing where the government wants it is also good for banks. So the credit risk of banks is much lower than we think. The loan growth of banks will be much higher than we think. Their margins will be reasonable. Their valuations are OK. So this is not bad for banks for several years. In the long run, banks are poodles of the state, uh, and I'm not sure that's a good place to be in the long run, but banks won't surprise in many things over the next several years. Uh, the climate agenda means huge investment in renewables and lots of cheap credit available to invest in them. Uh, producing what we no longer buy in China means you should be in production stocks, uh, building the CapEx, CapEx, uh, CapEx stocks, uh, and friend shoring will be emerging markets. But the real problem is who doesn't get credit in a license raj regime? And these are the people who will not get credit. Now, I would divide them very simply and say, if you borrow money to gear up an existing asset, it's going to be very difficult to get that credit. If you borrow money to build a new asset, a new productive asset, a new cash flow, a new product that, or a new investment that employs people, then in this world where the government plays a bigger role, you will be able to get 
credit. And those are the companies I've already mentioned in the last slide. But here are the people who I think will have to re-equitize. And one of the great bull markets, or the drivers of the bull market in the US in particular, has been de-equitization, the use of more debt. Uh, but here are the people who will struggle to get that. Uh, investment bankers, private equity, uh, commercial property, people borrowing to buy back their own shares. Now, if you go through a prolonged period of re-equitization, issuing equity at the same time that savings institutions are selling their equities to buy government bonds, then you're going to get a downdraft in equity valuation. So those are, I'll leave those up, those are the conclusions about where you should be investing in the world. It's very much not about countries and more about sectors of the uh, of world economy. Uh, I have really spoken for a long time and really just scraped the surface on financial depression. Uh, but for those of you in the audience old enough to remember the license rise, you will remember what happens when governments get involved in the allocation of credit and capital and the manifest uh, distortions that occur in any economy when that comes along. And the, I think in conclusion, the good news is India avoids it. The bad news is most of the developed world gets it. So Ritika, on that rather alarming uh, final conclusion for everybody who's still around uh, on Saturday evening, uh, I'll hand it back to you for Q&A. Thanks, thanks, Russell, for a really, really great session. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, so I'm a mother to a seven-year-old, and uh, there's Rudiger, one Just to let you know, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Russell? I can hear you very clearly. Fantastic. Uh, I was saying that I'm a mother to a seven-year-old, and the one thing he knows about Indian financial markets already is that India is overvalued. Uh, that's how well everybody thinks. Uh, that's how much everybody thinks India is overvalued. So thank you for giving us, you know, a fresh perspective on India to start with, uh, because now we see India in a very different light uh, as compared to the, you know, the very short term picture, which can be focused on relative valuation multiples. Uh, you've given us a helicopter view of how you need to look at an emerging market like India. With that done, I'm going to request everybody to punch in their questions. Uh, I think I should highlight to you that uh, you know there's a lot of large asset managers who will pay a lot of money to ask Russell questions. Uh, thanks to uh, CFA Society India getting Russell to speak to us at this conference, you can ask these questions fully for free. Uh, so do make the most of this opportunity. Uh, and we already have some questions that are ready here, uh, so I'll dive straight into them. Uh, I think one question that we're getting from a lot of people in the audience is about Japan, Russell. Uh, and I think, you know, to summarize all the questions that we're getting, uh, here's, here's uh, the situation that Japan is dealing with. Uh, like you said, they're loaded to their eyeballs with debt. Uh, you know, whether you look at government debt, whether you look at private sector debt, they're loaded to their eyeballs with debt. Uh, the good news, perhaps, is the fact that inflation seems to be coming back. Uh, because like you said, if you want to pursue financial repression, one of the prerequisites of sorts is to have a degree of inflation. Uh, but uh, the complication is that interest rates are rising. I mean, you've gone from negative yields to positive yield ter territory. Uh, until the BOJ did nothing last week, you were also crossing 0.5% on the 10-year JGB. So that's complication number one. Uh, interest rates are clearly rising and heading upwards. Complication number two is that Japan is already pretty financially repressed. You know, you could make that argument to the extent that the Bank of Japan owns 50% of government debt, 50% uh, of the assets held by Japanese banks, ladies and gentlemen, are in fact in, uh, in, in government debt. Uh, so that's complication number two. Uh, you're, you're dealing with a country which already has a lot of features of classic financial repression. And finally, it looks like the private sector deleveraging cycle in Japan is coming to a close. Uh, the private sector wants to actually borrow more and more money. Uh, so your, your views, Russell, on Bank of Japan, on Japan, what happens uh, to this you know, fairly large developed market uh, over the next few years? Yeah, I, I think you've made some really important points there about interest rates and the sensitivity to rising rates. So I think most people are of the camp. They can't continue to do what they're doing, so they will let interest rates go up. I don't think they can. Uh, 
I think the sensitivity is too great. And you've mentioned the sensitivity in parts of the private sector, but let's talk about the Bank of Japan itself. The Bank of Japan has a huge portfolio. This is its assets, which is going to be yielding a low yield. Uh, and if they start putting interest rates up, their liabilities should be at a much higher yield than the liabilities of any central bank or commercial bank reserves. So let's pick a, a 1%, which is a number I see bandied about in the market. You would have a central bank paying 1% on reserves and receiving 25 basis points on its portfolio. It wouldn't just be that there'd be a huge capital loss as you move from a yield of 50 basis points to 100 basis points on the JGB. You'd be locking in for a very long time a huge running loss. Now, there are other central bankers in the world who have had negative equity, and it really hasn't had a particularly negative effect. But the problem for the Bank of Japan is you'd be locking it in. It would be locked in for a very long period of time. So if we add together the problems that you've mentioned for banks, commercial banks, and the, and the central bank, I think they can't let interest rates go up. Or maybe they can attempt 75 basis points. Maybe they can attempt 100, but inflation is now roughly at four. And that's the financial repression I'm talking about. It's forcing, and what I mean by a savings institution, we should be very clear here, it's a, not a bank. Uh, a bank is a bank. A bank creates its own liabilities, can expand its assets, can expand its liabilities. We're talking about savings institutions, which are pension funds and life funds, and they have lots of assets that they could sell to buy JGBs. As I mentioned, the unfortunate thing is many of them are offshore. So it's, it's interesting reading the commentary because the commentary seems to be there are only two options, continue with the status quo, which looks highly dangerous, or let rates go up. There's a third option. Let us see in the next week or two whether that one comes to pass. It has a negative impact on everybody else's government bonds, but also I think something else might happen. I, I've been talking about this for a very long time. The feedback I get from my clients is that form of financial repression is so stupid that no government would do it. Well, if the Bank of Japan, or actually it will be the Ministry of Finance, if the Ministry of Finance goes to that option, I think people will look at France, at the United Kingdom, maybe even at the United States and say, oh my goodness, there is another arrow in the quiver. And that is particularly bad for us. And they'll begin to contemplate, perhaps for the first time, that actually that form of financial repression is possible way beyond Japan. I mean, it's a big, big country with a big economy. And that's a huge structural step and it will waken people up to what governments will do to stop that bubble from bursting. It's not a bubble that can be allowed to burst, full stop. I, I don't make all my forecasts with a high, necessarily a very high degree of confidence, but I would say to you that the government bond market cannot burst, cannot be allowed to burst. And we might see that within days, if not weeks, in Japan. And the Ministry of Finance will declare the yield curve, not the Bank of Japan. And then we'll also realize that finance ministers can play a huge role in setting interest rate policy. And that will be another great wake up call for people in the rest of the world. Right, right. That's, that's a really interesting perspective. I'm going to jump straight into the second question. Uh, so Russell, you and I are probably a minority in this room as strategists, uh, but there's a lot of stock pickers in this room. There's a lot of uh, sector allocators in this room. Are there any specific sectors globally that are looking good to you? Uh, you know, that's something the audience wants to know. Your picks in terms of sectors that should do well in the short term. Yeah, so I, I mentioned several sectors for the, for the long term, which is uh, banks, emerging market equities, uh, CapEx stocks, people who compete with China. There is something kind of in common in there, and it's asset heavy. And in a world of inflation, you need to reconsider whether you should be investing in asset heavy. Remember, accountants play quite an important role in all of this. Uh, and in a world where the value of assets, tangible physical assets, is rising, uh, accountants probably, if, if reluctantly, might have to raise the value of those assets. Obviously, there'll be depreciation to be considered. But intangible assets, it is not clear to me at all that they will go up. And if the intangible asset is goodwill accounting, then actually it's going to keep coming down. The other beauty of uh, people who have tangible assets is they tend to have long-term debt against them, not short-term debt against them. So those are the types of sectors that you should be looking at. I think even in 2023, if I'm right about Japan and, and financial repression generally, we'll see real evidence of it in 2023. And then people will begin to say, well, what do I do if interest rates cannot reflect inflation? If the discount rate is to be permanently low and the growth rate measured in nominal terms, is to be permanently high. Uh, 
what sort of stocks do I buy? Because I hadn't thought of that before. I'd always thought that interest rates would reflect inflation. And I think they'll turn more and more to stocks with tangible assets, particularly if those tangible assets have seen their returns uh, destroyed or reduced by, by China. So there's quite a lot in that presentation for sectors. Uh, but if you sort of try and boil it all down, it's, it's to go for asset heavy and to be concerned about asset light. And that's maybe over that 10, 15 year period, one of the reasons why the S&P does so badly is because we realize we shouldn't really be paying such a premium for those intangible brand assets. Uh, we should maybe be paying more for the people who physically produce those products as opposed to the people who own the brands. Right. Uh, I think that's that's a really key point, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and it kind of stayed with me when Russell said this earlier as well, uh, that the main reason why the U.S. loses representation in any global index or underperforms is because the U.S. has built brand-heavy businesses uh, while the rest of the world has managed to build asset-heavy businesses. And like Russell is saying, in a world where there is inflation, you want to be with asset-heavy businesses as compared to brand-heavy businesses. I think we are almost out of time, and I'll take up one last question, one last question that affects anybody and everybody around the world. Uh, so Russell, no, no pressure, uh, but here's, here's the question. Uh, what happens to the U.S. dollar over the next few years? Uh, you know, we've had a tremendous rally, uh, and that's, that's kind of affected how emerging markets also do. What happens over the next few years as you get into a world where developed markets have to resort to financial repression uh, to deal with their massive debt piles? Okay, well, there's only a 90-minute answer to that question. That's the biggest question in finance, but I'll try and do it, <laughs> I'll try and do it in two minutes. Uh, I did mention that the sequencing of financial repression is incredibly important. Uh, if, I mean, Japan might go first. I think China would probably have to go and have a flexible exchange rate, Europe, but America at the very end. So therefore, that's not a scenario where you would predict a weak dollar uh, if others have to go to financial repression first because capital tends to leave. Uh, there's just a little wrinkle in Japan uh, that the yen might go up before it goes down, but on the whole, uh, if you do financial, remember what financial repression is. It's an interference with private sector property rights. It goes to the very core of what capitalism is. Uh, and people will flee to the United States where they believe those property rights will be more protected. I'm not so sure about that in the long run, but really relatively sure in the short run. So for the dollar, I'm not negative. Uh, also, I need to talk about this issue of reserve currency status. It, it is certainly possible that this year Saudi Arabia agrees to uh, sell its oil for renminbi. Uh, and that would give you certainly a couple of down days on the dollar. I think we all understand that. Uh, but the important question is not whether Saudi will accept B. The question is, will they hold them? Right. China, wants, China wants that transaction because, it, you know, if you're not transacting in dollars, then the market can't interfere with the flow of money. But Saudi Arabia has been able to hold B since I think 2014 is when we opened up the B for reserve managers. Uh, and they haven't done it. And hardly anybody's done it apart from the Russians. So I don't ultimately see a major shift in reserves into the B. And, and just finally, if you make a long list, let's say you list the top 20 reserve managers in the world, almost all of them are defended by the United States, whether it be Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Norway, Switzerland, India, Indonesia. I mean, are, are we really going to see these countries shifting their reserves into B? I don't think so. So I don't, you know, that great structural negative call that the dollar is finished as a reserve currency. I, I don't buy it. I don't buy it at all. And in the short run, you could have more capital flowing to America if financial repression comes more quickly elsewhere. Uh, just finally, the dollar can't become too strong. I think last November we saw what happens if the dollar gets too strong. We had a major uh, swap line went from the Federal Reserve to the Swiss National Bank. That helped stop the dollar going up. Uh, the Japanese intervened in the foreign exchange market. That stopped the dollar going up. So a dollar on the strong side, in my opinion, uh, but it, it can't be allowed to rise much above where it, much above its peak, because I think we saw action then uh, to try and stop it, although it wasn't picked up by most commentators. Right. Uh, thank you, thank you, Russell, for giving us uh, you know brilliant food for thought for the weekend. Uh, you know, I can tell from the audience's faces here that you know everybody is really thinking hard at this point in time, trying to digest what you've told us. Thank you, thank you for sparing time for this conversation. I'll now hand over to Kishore uh, to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you.